you talk about how your theories apply in the age of social media? And I think about symmetrical, uh, your, your symmetrical model, for instance. That's very interesting. I just saw a blog in, in some place in the UK this last week that said the Grunig theories need to be reevaluated now in the age of social media. And I thought, I looked at that and I said, no, they're more applicable now than they ever were. In fact, what digital media, social, uh, digital media in a broad sense, I think digital media are broader than social media. But they've made the symmetrical model inevitable, in my opinion. I just don't see how any organization can try to communicate with publics without listening, without engaging in dialogue, without uh, trying to understand how they see their interest when organizations make decisions and behave in certain ways. Because uh, there was what I called the illusion of control before, that public relations people and organizations, and in general the organizations they work for, seem to believe they control, could control the message that would go into publics and that would control the way they thought about their organization. I never really did think that was true. People were able to talk to each other and they got information from different sources. They weren't restricted to media or to advertising or what else. They had their own experiences. They talked to other people. They read other sources of information. But it's now the, the digital media just makes it much easier to do that. So if you want information about a product, for example, um, I'm at the age now where I use a lot of, of medical <laughs> problems, <laughs> medical products, and I don't take anything without doing an internet search first. And the person, the, the site I'm least likely to trust is the one that's coming from the pharmaceutical company. Um, same way I wouldn't buy a dehumidifier for my basement without seeing whether people say it breaks down after a year. So it, one, the control has, it, I think control was always in the hands of, of people, uh, you know, individuals and publics. Uh, but now it is much more in their hands because you just can go anywhere to get information and it's, you're not restricted to what uh, organizations choose to, to make available for you. And so this symmetrical model basically is a model of, of dialogue and it's a model of, of looking out both for the interests of your organization and for the publics that are affected by the organization. And it's much easier to d it's much easier for an organization to find out how publics are affected because they can simply go online and do searches and, and read blogs and find out what people are saying about how decisions are affecting them. So I think that uh, the new media make it very interesting, very interesting to practice public relations because it's, um, I think it's going to be much easier to convince management that they have to be more open in, in communicating with publics and that you really can't use the symbolic interpretive approach to try to put out an interpretation that you want people to hear because they'll easily get a different interpretation someplace else much about the ethical challenges that are raised for public relations practitioners as a result of the rise of new media. I've said many times that that the symmetrical model is inherently ethical. Um, an asymmetrical model is not necessarily uh, inherently unethical, as I've been accused of saying many times. Uh, but to practice an asymmetrical model, you have to be able to prove to yourself or to others that what you are trying to persuade someone else to do is actually in their best interest. And it, it may not always be because I think there are oftentimes efforts, I, I've talked about convincing people to smoke, to use guns, to do all sorts of things that are, are not in their best interest but in the, the person who's doing the message really thinks it is. So with the symmetrical model, you leave it open to dialogue and you don't try to decide for the other person what is in his or her best interest. So that uh, the, it's what a, a theorist, uh, Ron Pearson, said several years ago, the obligation of dialogue. 
that ethically you have an obligation to engage in dialogue with your publics whenever the organization that you represent has some kind of consequences on the public or publics. So the consequent, there are two versions of ethics, consequentialist ethics or utilitarian ethics, which says that you know, whenever you have negative consequences on someone, then uh, you should examine whether that behavior is, is good. Uh, the problem with consequential, consequentialist ethics is that sometimes a behavior has good effects on one party but not on the other one. So how do you decide which one gets precedence over the other one? Uh, that was always the problem with utilitarian uh, ethics, the greater good for the greater number and so on. But, but at least I believe in utilitarian ethics because of, of the concept of consequences. I think that's the most important term in public relations. Uh, a public comes into existence when an organization behaves in a way that has consequences on the public. And when a public recognizes those consequences, then it begins to think about them and to communicate about them. This comes from my studies of John Dewey when I was a graduate student many years ago. But then there are the limitations of consequentialist ethics. So if you add uh, into that deontological ethics, which basically says uh, what are the rules that you could follow that would make, uh, if you follow those rules, uh, your behavior or your actions would be ethical. And the rule is the obligation of dialogue, which doesn't mean that you make decisions for others or, or you, you always do what is probably the, the best thing or the, the thing that's best for everyone, but you leave it up to dialogue and people can you come together and uh, the way you behave may or may not be the most ethical thing, but at least you listen to the other party and you've engaged in dialogue with them. So anyway, my theory of ethics is essentially whenever an organization behaves or is thinking of behaving in a way that will have consequences on a public and the consequences bring about the public, then you have the obligation to engage in dialogue with it. So then the question is, what do you do after the dialogue? Do you do what they want you to do or what do you think is you would like to do or what is right? And that's never easy to decide. But then one has to engage in some kind of social reason to think through, you know, and now I've listened to the other side, I've thought through our side, and I've made a decision based on the best information I have available. The other, the other party, the public, may not always agree that this is most ethical, but at least it, the, the other party will have uh, had a part in that decision, and so it, it is going to be more ethical than and if you didn't make that decision. So now if you apply that to social media, I think the obligation of dialogue, well, you can find out what kind of consequences you're having by doing environmental scanning, by, by looking at what people are saying on the, ma on the social media, on the, the digital media, about the effects of your company or your organization's behavior on them. And then you can engage in dialogue, either by by joining into blogs of which they may be a part, or setting up your own blog or your own uh, Facebook page or any way in which you can engage in dialogue with those publics. Now, I think that the, the biggest ethical challenge comes with the concept of lurking. You know, when can you listen in on people when they don't know you are listening in to them? Uh, and that I'm not sure if anybody has an easy answer for, except that uh, I think that if you're going, that you need to reveal, again, making it known that you are listening, that you're present, that you're part of the conversation, is an important part of that ethical challenge. So. Uh, I think there are times when we simply want to listen in what what publics are saying without actually saying, well, I'm here from XYZ company and I'm listening to what you're saying. Uh, I think there are times when we can gain information in that way and, and take it to management and so on. But before we ever quote them or or do anything with that information, I think we have the obligation to reveal 
to those parties that, that we've been listening in and we've taken part in the conversation. Something else that strikes me that, that social media raises in terms of ethical challenges in, in the model that you've talked about um, is this idea that the dialogue that you're listening to is much more public. Everybody can listen to it, right? right? right. And so then the decisions that are made after you listen are, can be viewed by everybody through that right. prism. Right. Uh, and that just, um, does that ratchet up the ethical stakes? Well, good friend and former colleague, Mark McElreed, who taught originally at the University of Maryland with me and then at Towson University, wrote a book on ethics. And, and his first rule of ethics was if, if you make this decision, are you willing to go on national television and announce it to everyone? And that's, I think, <laughs> that's a very good rule because if you cannot make that what you're doing uh, known to those that are going to be affected, then you probably shouldn't be doing it. Or if you try to engage in a behavior without saying you're doing it, uh, somebody's probably going to find out and they're going to reveal it on digital media. So it's going to come out whether you like it to or not. So the question is, uh, with social responsibility, if I'm making a decision, if management is making a de decision that carries a great deal of risk for a public, and I can't announce that risk to the public, then I probably shouldn't be making that decision. So I think the... The social media then give us two things there that really makes everything transparent whether we want to or not. And if we try to withhold information from people, it's probably going to come out. But then it also gives us, um, you know, it gives us the, a means for talking about potential decisions before they're made. Um, and then making the decision with the best information. Now I stop here for just a minute because there's something happened at the University of Maryland just in the last couple of weeks that uh, Maryland decided to join the Big Ten Conference. Uh, and the entire decision was made in private. <laughs> and as I understand, now all of my theories would say this is a terrible mistake. And from what I read about this decision, uh, it wasn't totally in private. The, the Washington Post ran a very lengthy article about it this weekend. Um, and the president of the university consulted with the lawyers, of course, but also with primary major donors, with some board of regents, but not all of the board of regents, and with uh, coaches, you know, many people who would, who would be affected by that decision before he made that decision. So in a sense, he was gathering information. Now, there was a non-disclosure agreement made with the Big Ten Conference that they couldn't say anything about this before the decision was made. So what would have happened, ideally, the whole thing would have been vetted on the Internet and discussed, and, and there would have been hearings, there would have been discussion of all of this. But I suppose there's a competitive advantage involved here. So. This gets into very difficult kind of area. To how much, how open can you be when, when uh, there's you know when a decision is going to might be adversely affected and it might not be possible to make that decision if it's going to be open again. So, I'm not quite sure how that whether that was decision was made properly. It, it, there's even been argued that it violated Maryland's public uh, open meetings law because it, the vote was taken without having an open meeting and so on. But I think that's a very interesting ethical question here that people should think about. I, I can see both aspects of it. On the one hand, I think it should have been much more open and much more dialogue. Then on the other hand, it might have not have been possible to make the decision if that had actually been done. So, uh, it sounds to me as though the Maryland case will will uh, make a great case study at some point. At some point, <laughs> I think. 
Um, speaking of case studies, and, and you talked earlier about uh, your travel, and of course you've been a leader in the public relations education field for, for uh, decades, and I guess I'm, I'm wondering how should the teaching of public relations be different today than it was a decade ago? Well, if I, if I were still teaching, there are two aspects of public relations education. One is the theoretical aspect of it, and the other is the implementation of theory. And actually, I would teach public relations theory exactly the way today, the way I taught it 20 or 30 years ago, although I wouldn't teach it exactly the same way because I know more than I did 20 or 30 years ago. I've done a lot more research, so every year uh, that I taught public relations theory, I would teach something a little bit different, although the basic framework, I think, was the same. But as I added pieces, uh, I've written an article I called Furnishing the Edifice. And the idea is the edifice meant I framed the house, I, I put the pieces together, but then there are a lot of details that need to be worked out. So there are certain theories that I've developed, the situational theory of publics on the nature of publics. I developed that theory when I was doing my doctoral dissertation and as part of a term paper in a communication theory class at the University of Wisconsin. And I tinkered with that theory over the years, but the basic framework is the same. And I've worked with a, a former PhD student, uh, Jung Nam Kim, who's now at Purdue University, who's made substantial changes in that theory. So it, it would change, but again, it would be the similar sort of thing. The symmetrical model, the strategic management approach, all of those, I think, are as relevant today or even more relevant than, than they were some time ago. And particularly, as I said, with, with new media, uh, that there, which the new media, I think, impact the, the techniques, the, 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 act, you know, the actual programs and activities that one does in public relations. But I think the, the theory is essentially the same. Now, there's the idea that keeps going around the excellence theory, for example, I'll read on the internet that somebody says, this is an old theory, it's been discredited, et cetera, et cetera. And I look at practice now and I can't see that it's any different than when we did that study or that study isn't just as relevant now as it ever was. So I think we keep reinventing the wheel. I, I think one sees this. I. Actually, the situational theory of publics came from John Dewey, who wrote a book called The Public and Its Problems in the 1920s. So I suppose I reinvented the wheel, but we come up with new ideas. So I think the theories are more relevant today than they ever have been. Uh, publics uh, evolve more than they have. and uh, They evolve in different ways. They can evolve on the Internet and so on, and we need to do that. But I think the way, you know, I, I can see the day where the, the typical thing of trying to place news stories in, journal, in newspapers and so on will be a thing of the past. It's much more effective and efficient to do things on the Internet, to engage publics in the Internet. I think research um, is going to be much more done via, via the Internet. We can... Uh, monitor what people are saying. It's much more easy, it's much easier to do research, I think, because, well, we can do questionnaires and, and, and even focus groups via the internet, via so, uh, new media. Uh, and that's not always sure how representative the sample is that we get in that way, but we can do research in that way. But I think that just by monitoring the content and content analyzing the content is of what is on, on uh, digital media, uh, we can do a huge amount of research. You know, people have talked about big data uh, and so on. That that's, I think research is going to be considerably different in public relations uh, with new media. And then I think uh, simply the way we communicate with with publics, whether they be 
employees or communities or students or anyone. We're going to do it more and more on the internet, on, on social media. And so we're, we have to teach students how to do those things. Uh, I think the nature of the research, the nature of the dialogue, the, the kinds of messages, what we do, that hasn't changed a great deal, but the way we actually uh, implement it, implement those theories is considerably different.